When you're doing turnkey investing, usually, turnkey investing, out-of-state investing, usually, you're doing so because you want the cash flow. You're not thinking about appreciation. But I want you to think about both right now. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the show, folks. Welcome to the show. Before I do more talking, I need you to wipe the Cheeto dust off of your face and hit the subscribe button, okay? I need to get to 100,000 subscribers, and then I'm going to get one of them plaques, and I'm going to put it, like, right here. I'm going to put it right here. And when you see that, you could be sitting there on your iPhone one day talking to your buddy, like, die, man, I helped him get that plaque. He told me to wipe the Cheeto dust off my face, and then I hit subscribe, and now he's got a plaque. That could be you. That could be you, right? Now, Outside of trying to get to 100,000 subs, what I'm trying to do is help a guy with $100,000, right? $100,000. My man, Terry. Terry is an investor from Maryland. He already wiped the Cheeto dust off his face and subscribed. Good job, Terry. Also, good job for partnering with me so we can help you turn that 100 k into a lot more, okay? Now, Terry, you got a situation here. And uh, I, I kind of am going to deviate from what you asked me to do for you for a couple reasons, right? You came to me because you want cash flow. You have $100,000. You're like, cash flow, James. Give me the cash flow, bro. I'm interested in like Section 8, C-grade neighborhoods, D-grade neighborhoods. Give me that cash flow. But I want th you to think about more than that right now, Terry. I want you to think about how to get cash flow and appreciation. And I think it's very important for you because of your personal situation. You're a little bit older of a dude to be getting in the rental game, right? You're not, like, ancient, right? You're not, like, a fucking billion years old or nothing, but you're 59, right? You're 59 years old. And uh, when we talk about people just getting back into the game, right, because technically you're fresh now, right? You were in the game before. We'll talk about it in a second. But, like, you know, you're starting a whole new real estate business at 59. That is towards the older age <coughs> of Real estate investors. And as you well know, Terry, there's risk in real estate because you were heavily involved in real estate back before the great crash, right? The huge crash. Uh, 08 to 011, you told me you lost it all and went bankrupt, right? And uh, now <coughs> you're getting back in. You're getting back on the horse. But, like, in my opinion, bro, I think it would be uh, inappropriate of me to try to get you into something that's a little higher risk when, you know, you're a little down the road in your age and I think, like, when you're younger, right, if you're 20s, 30s, like, you could take big swings and you could come back from bankruptcies, things of that nature, right? I think as we get older, folks, we need to start looking at lower risk stuff, okay? So I think that's very important for you, Terry. But I got something that you definitely can afford uh, with your money, okay? And it's in one of the hottest a-grade neighborhoods in Cleveland, which I think you'll get cash flow, same kind of cash flow you can get in the lower-income neighborhoods. You're going to get way less risk, and I think you're also going to benefit from some appreciation, some gentrification, some things of that nature. So without further ado, Terry, let's jump into that. Actually, wait, hold on before we jump into that. Everybody else out there who hasn't subscribed, get the Cheeto dust off your face. Do so also if you want to work with me one-on-one -on -one like Terry's doing Right here, send my team an email, give us your number, hop on the phone. The property I'm doing for Terry, all the good stuff you're about to see after this, because, oh, oh, boy, if you did the show was good so far, wait till it comes back from the break. It's going to be fire, fire, like fire Cheeto dust that's on your face. Wipe it off, hit subscribe, and if you want to partner with us, you do so by sending us an email. We'll hop on the phone, talk to you about getting your own videos like Terry. You could also click the show notes below. Of course, I got the link there for you, folks. But that's it. That's all the plugs I have. That's all the pitching. Okay, okay. We're going to go to the break. And, Terry, I'm going to show you a banging deal and why I think it's a banging deal and why it's the right move for you, bro. Two, please. No, I think I was drinking a lot. Welcome 
back, folks. This, this property has me excited. What we're talking about today has me thrilled, right? People come to this market, to the Cleveland market, to work with me because they want cash flow, right? They can't get the cash flow in expensive places, right? California, Canada, New York, Oregon, right? Cash flow is tough, right? But traditionally, you invest in those markets for appreciation. And then markets like mine, like Cleveland, like Detroit, like Memphis, like Indianapolis. These are markets, Milwaukee, that are typically looked at as your cash flow markets. You don't go there for appreciation. You go there for cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, right? And that's the correct assessment. I am not on the show telling anybody out there that Cleveland is like the appreciation <laughs> destination of the world. It's not, okay? It's not in the Sun Belt. It's in the Midwest, right? Traditionally speaking, you're not going to see major population growth in the Midwest. It's not how it works, right? Uh, so it will never be an appreciation market. That said, there are areas of the air of the Cleveland market that you can get appreciation. And I'm sure that's the same for all those other turnkey markets I mentioned. But, like, I'm here in Cleveland, and I've sold $200 million worth of real estate in Cleveland. So we're going to focus on what I'm an expert on in a deal right here that highlights all of that, okay? I like this deal for many, many reasons. 6911 Franklin Boulevard, Cleveland, 44102. It's been on the market for 34 days, and it's overpriced. It's overpriced, but we're going to work on that. 495K. This is in, like, one of the hottest friggin' neighborhoods you can get in Cleveland. Like, dude, this is where you want to be. We're doing, like, luxury Airbnbs. And we could possibly maybe one day turn this into an Airbnb, double up that return probably. Uh, but I, I prefer right now we're sticking with just single-family Airbnbs, right? And I don't want to turn it into a situation where we turn, like, one unit into an Airbnb and then long-term tenants and the rest. I think that would be problematic, but the idea is out there. But what we're talking about right here is Detroit Shoreway. This is, like, one of the most badass neighborhoods in Cleveland, right? When people talk about resurgence of Cleveland and they talk about the happening things, the gentrification, right? The neighborhoods, those are happening in the biggest neighborhoods in Cleveland. Edgewater, Detroit Shoreway, Ohio City, Tremont. One, two, three, four. Those are the four on the west side. And then if you cruise over to the east side, you also got some, some gnarly areas, right? University Circle, totally gnarly. And then you got, uh, I got to zoom in a little bit so you can see it, but Little Italy, right next to University Circle. Like this, this whole little... All this jazz. I mean, University Circle has got their own police force. I mean, that's, this is all good stuff, too, right? So if you're on the east side, it's those two. If you're on the west side, it's the ones I mentioned, right? And they're doing a lot of stuff in these neighborhoods to make gentrification happen, right? They're doing tax abatements on new construction, right? People are getting 15-year tax abatements, right? You buy a crummy house, tear it down, build a new house. You don't pay taxes on it for 15 years. They're forcing that stuff because they want this gentrification. So the city's like behind these neighborhoods. And because of that, we're seeing huge, huge increases in property values, right? You can buy single family new construction homes in this neighborhood for like five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars right now, right? So if you're gonna invest in Cleveland, you're doing so for the cash flow. But if you wanna hop on an appreciation train, you need to be in a path of progress neighborhood. You need to be in an area like this where there's things popping, right? Ain't nobody building new construction housing in the C-grade neighborhoods of Cleveland, right? If you guys watch my show for any period of time, we do a lot of Section 8 investing, okay? A lot of it, right? Like, old Brooklyn's a popular neighborhood. Like, all these, like, areas where you can buy duplexes for, like, 100K, right? Those are not areas right now that people are building new construction homes, right? These are those areas, right? So if you're really trying to pop upon the appreciation bandwagon, these are the proven neighborhoods. Now, with that said, though, Clark Fulton, the Metro Health area, I think that's going to be the next one because there's a lot of money coming into there. There's like billions of dollars going into there. Uh, Metro Health is doing a billion dollars. Transit Authority just did like another 60 million or something. So like, and that borders. It's just south of all these neighborhoods that have already like hit the the mark with five hundred thousand dollar houses right so areas like this you already get huge rents high quality tenants that neighborhood in my opinion is the next one 
on the way, right? So here, what we have here, this is a very good opportunity. It's a four-unit apartment building. Four-unit apartment buildings are my favorite type of investment of all time because the financing is so butter! Ah! Financing, man. That's why I like real estate as an investment vehicle, dude. Like, first of all, like, I don't, like, love real estate, like, just in general of, like, I mean, I love real estate, but, like, I don't love it because, like, I love houses, and I'm just like, oh, my God, look at the architecture, and I want to, like, hug this fucking house like I care, right? now. I love real estate because it's an investment vehicle, right? But if I thought I could make more money uh, doing something else, I would do that, right? But with real estate, what really attracted me to real estate was you can work your day job and invest in real estate, right? You could do it part-time. You could do it passively. You could do it out of state, right? Hard to do. A lot of other businesses like that. And then the financing. You put down a quarter. The bank puts down three quarters. And they let you take that for 30 years. Fixed interest, low interest. Greatest financing in the world. But that's the thing with that financing. There's two downsides. It's residential financing where you do 25, bank does 75, and you get 30 years to pay it down. The two downsides are you only get 10 of those, number one. Number two, it's got to be on single-family homes, duplexes, triplexes, quads. So if you're putting the math together in your head, that means the quad is the biggest building you can get with the amazing financing. Once you go to a five-unit, your financing sucks. It's terrible. Uh, it's not good, right? I mean, it's not like the end of the world, right? But if you haven't exhausted 10 mortgages, there'd be no reason to do some crummy financing with like a five-year uh, call, like a 25-year AM variable rate interest rate and down payments with the way pricing is in 2021 of probably like 40 to 65% down. Like, screw that. 25% down 30 years. That's where it's at, baby. Right here. So, love that. And uh, what this is, this is a long-time landlord. Long time. He's owned this thing for a long, long, long time. Bought it before the neighborhood was popping. Before you could buy houses for half a million, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars. This dude bought it, ran it as like a low income property, right? For friggin' ever. Okay? He's got one vacant unit and then he's got a bunch of low income tenants in there. I'm gonna go over the market rents and the current rents here momentarily. This thing is something that he like ran back when this was like a C grade neighborhood lower than that, right? Now it's basically an A grade neighborhood, right? So I think this thing is going to even continue to project up based on all the government incentives uh, to get new houses built, right? All them yuppies that are coming in, right? So there's all your photos. But even though every photo you saw was empty, three of the units are currently occupied. And this dude, just old timer, ready to get out of the business, retire. <laughs> He's got month to month tenants and they're paying 550 950 and then he's got one in there till April paying 850 right now here's what market rents are right now today the two ones 1250 all day the one ones 1000 all day so 4500 54k right of that 54k i anticipate you spending approximately 23 uh, 275 to pay my team to manage this for you and all your normal expenses, fixed and variable expense estimates. You got to pay taxes, you got to pay insurance, people break stuff, people move out. Uh, evictions don't really happen in neighborhoods like this very often, but they do happen in the business, so we account for all that, right? So pure profit, 30725 Now, as far as price goes, I think he's still overpriced. This is definitely worth more than 500 k He's got it at 495 It's worth more than 500 k if you got the market rents, but dog. <laughs> you don't got the market rents, dude. You got like your your long time, old time tenants that uh, they're paying like, you know, rents that they should have been paying 30 years ago. Right. Like, come on, bro. You got somebody in there paying 550, dude. Like you could have rented this for 550 in like probably 1990. Right. Uh, so because of that, it's not worth over 500 today. And I don't think it's worth 495. I think we could pick it up. 450, 450. Now, one of the units is empty. So we're going to drop 20 G's into that right off the rip. Get somebody in there paying market rent. The other three tenants, I say we slowly work them up, right? The person paying five fifty, obviously that's the biggest one. Get them up. The people paying nine fifty and eight fifty, we don't need to like freak out, right? Shouldn't be in a rush to drop another twenty k in their units, right? Because you saw the pictures; those were not high end. We need them to be high end, right? So we want to get the empty unit. That's where we do. That's what we focus on first. We get that one renovated. We get that one ready to rock. Bring in max rent. And then the other ones we work on slowly. We want the money continually coming in, not going out. Don't get me wrong. I don't mind when you guys wire like $20,000, $80,000 out to Cleveland 
uh, for my team to do <laughs> renovations, but like you need to be paid yourself, right? So it makes no sense to remove income streams, right? Keep collecting that rent, and eventually we might be able to get them up to market rent just based on the location because uh, of how nice it is and how desirable it is without even having to do those turns, right? There's turnovers in the real estate business, right? And they're expensive. So you want to mitigate those as much as possible. Never create artificial turnovers, right? So assuming we can get the other three people up to market rent, which may or may not happen, right? It's possible. Uh, it's unlikely we get all three up to market rent without at least one turnover. It's also, in my opinion, unlikely we have to turn over all three of those units to get them to market rent. I think, you know, maybe like one or two will deflect or the other way, right? So if... <clears throat> we do do that though, right? We'd be looking at a total investment of 470k, 132 and a half out of your pocket. That's 112 for the DP down payment for those of you at home who are not following my abbreviation there. DP down payment, not double penetration. That's not what we talk about on this show, folks. No, that's another show. Anyway, 112,500 for the down payment, 20k in those upfront repairs that should project you out to a 10.3% cash on cash return, 7 cap, making a clear cash flow after mortgage 13,649. You're paying 17,900 and I just crossed off that number by circling it. I don't know. You're paying almost 18 grand to the bank. But that's really going back in your pocket, right? So that's like equity, right? So you got your cash flow, you got your equity. You got $337,000 of a loan that them tenants are paying for you, plus the cash flow, plus you're in one of the hottest neighborhoods in town, which in my opinion, if anything's appreciating, it's the area where they're tearing down low-income housing at a rapid pace in building freaking five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars single family homes, folks. Do the math. You're insane if you don't pick this up. Not to mention, it's the biggest building you can get with the best financing there is. And if I can get you that forty-five thousand dollar discount off a of list price, we in the money. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.